Good morning. Well, our Lord has called and gathered us this morning to worship Him. And uh, we worship Him this morning for who He is in and of Himself, for who He is for us and for our salvation. And in the midst of our prayer and singing this morning, we continue in worship by reading His Holy Word. So open with me to Isaiah chapter 45. Our sermon in a few moments is going to be focused on verses 18 and following, but I would like to start by reading in verse 14 for context. Isaiah 45, beginning in verse 14. Thus says the Lord, The wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God besides him. Truly you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, He is God, who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord, and is there, there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In the Lord all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Amen. Children, it may take you uh, at least a couple of decades to, to understand how sweet it is to hear you sing those words. While standing broad-shouldered and quietly confident over the intersection of Central Expressway and Forest Lane for several months in the past year was a black billboard with three white words on it in all caps. Christ is Lord. As Christians, that's our confession. Uh, as it always has been. The Dutch New Testament scholar William Hendrickson uh, said that it was the paramount confession of the very early church. Uh, That's what defines us as Christians. It's also the ground of our hope. And that billboard, I, I think, in my experience, was a foretaste of heaven. Because the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And carrying that message to the ends of the earth was the great burden that the Lord placed on the heart of the Apostle Paul. And in its essence, that was the message that the prophet Isaiah proclaimed to the nation centuries before Paul. And that message is a burden of our text this morning in Isaiah 45. Uh, So we'll open up our passage under two main headings. First of all, 
the fact that the day is coming when every knee will bow, and secondly, what it will be like to experience that day. So first the fact, then the experience. First of all, the fact is that the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In order to open up this first main point, we'll look first at Isaiah 45, 18 through 25, and then we will read it with the Apostle Paul by looking to the New Testament, and then we'll return to Isaiah 45. So historically, in Isaiah 45, we find ourselves uh, before Judah's exile to Babylon. Isaiah was called and commissioned to warn, to exhort, and to announce that wrath was going out from the Lord and the people needed to repent. And uh, that was Isaiah's main emphasis in chapters 1 through 39 of the book. Yet even there, in chapters 1 through 39, if you read through it, you'll see uh, the Lord's merciful redemption strung through it uh, like pearls. Not only would the Lord justly curse the people, but He would also graciously bless. And uh, the, then chapters 40 through 66, Isaiah looked into the future in exile and even beyond it. In these chapters, the prophet speaks directly. In Isaiah chapter 45, the prophet Isaiah is speaking directly to his descendants that will come 150 years later. And one scholar illustrated Isaiah's purpose in chapters 40 through 66 uh, by comparing these chapters to a letter written from an aging grandfather to his baby granddaughter. Uh, the grandfather knows that he probably won't live to see his baby granddaughter on her wedding day, uh, but he knows the hardships of life and can foresee the difficulties that she's going to face as a wife and a mother. And so in his letter, he projects himself into the future, so to speak, uh, and writes to her on that day as if he's actually there. Imagine the encouragement of his granddaughter on her wedding day, thinking of the, the care that her grandfather took to think ahead, and even the wisdom and the foresight that he had uh, in giving her guidance for that day. That's a helpful image to understand what's going on in Isaiah at this point in the book. The emphasis of this section is hope, hope for a glorious future. The Lord intended that this message of hope uh, be proclaimed both in Israel and also to the nations around them. And so Isaiah 45 begins with a prophecy about the Lord's chosen instrument to free the people from exile in Babylon, Cyrus, the king of Persia. That's verses 1 through 13. And uh, then in verses 14 through 25, the prophet looks beyond the near future into a distant age of worldwide and everlasting salvation. Uh, we've taken verses 18 through 25 for our passage, but look at verse 18. Notice that it begins with the word for. That indicates that the contents of our passage are an explanation of what came before. The prophet proclaimed in verses 14 through 17 that a day is coming when Gentile nations will come to Israel confessing faith in, the, in their God so that uh, they, the nations, and Israel together uh, will be blessed with an everlasting salvation. That's verse 17. And in verses 18 through 25, the prophet opens up this message of worldwide and everlasting salvation. And the way that all nations would participate in this great salvation is by turning to the Lord. That's at the heart of verses 18 through 25. And Isaiah stated it clearly in verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Surrounding that central exhortation and promise are two persuasive reasons for the nations to turn to the Lord. First of all, in verses 18 through 21, all nations must turn to the Lord because of who He is. And second of all, in verses 23 through 25, all nations must turn to the Lord because that day is coming. First, all nations, in verses 18 through 21, must turn to the Lord because of who He is. 
And I would add by way of application, uh, all God's people should delight in him because of who he is. In verse 18, you see that God is the creator who made all things for a purpose. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. God creates. That is, as Paul wrote in Romans 4.17, He calls into existence things that do not exist. And as a potter molds clay into vessels uh, for admiration or for use, the Lord forms that matter that He created into its designated shape for its intended function. He is the God who creates and forms both the heavens and the earth. And if the heavens and the earth, then everything in between is the creator of all things. And there can only be one first cause of all things. Only one unmoved mover. Uh, we confess that this is our God, the creator. Therefore, all nations must turn to him and all his people should delight in him. In verse 19, the Lord is a God who speaks truth and righteousness. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth, and I declare what is right. Back in verse 15 of Isaiah 45, the people confessed God's transcendence, that he hides himself. As Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, Verse 16, He is the one who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one ever has seen nor can see. He is utterly beyond us, and so are His ways, unless He discloses them to us. And that's what He does. He speaks truth and declares what is right. You can trust Him. You can trust Him. You can take him at his word. The Lord is the transcendent God who speaks truth and righteousness and he is trustworthy. Therefore, all nations must turn to him and his people should delight in him. The Lord is greater than idols. Verse 20, uh, 20 and 21. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord, and there is no other besides me, a righteous God and a Savior? There is none besides me. He successfully predicts the future, and idols don't. As Isaiah will say in uh, chapter 46, verse 10, there is none like him declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. He can save, but idols can't. Isaiah illustrates this in chapter 46, verses 6 and 7. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. Then they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in its place, and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. You can compare uh, the, this mental image of someone carrying an idol. Compare the image of me carrying my one-year-old son and him trying to carry me. It's absurd. It is the God who should carry his people, not the people their God. That's the Lord's image for salvation in chapter 46, verses 3 and 4. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from your birth, carried from the womb. Even to your old age I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and will save. The Lord God of Israel can carry his people 
and he does not faint nor grow weary. But the idols of the nations need to be carried. Therefore we know that he is the righteous God and the Savior. There is none besides him. He alone is strong to save. So all nations must turn to him and his people should delight in him. So to sum up verses 18 through 21, the God of Israel is the sovereign creator and the only righteous savior. There is none besides him. So all nations must turn to him and you, his people, should delight in him. And then we see in verses 23 through the first part of verse 24 that all nations must turn to the Lord because that day is coming. And you, his people, should hope in him because that day is coming. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess confess to God, if you look at, if your Bible has a footnote for the Greek translation of verse 23, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. Notice in verse 23 the repetition of the word every. This is a universal response. Every creature under heaven without exception On that day, the Lord will receive universal reverence. Every knee will bow. And universal recognition. Every tongue will confess. And the certainty of this day's coming is rooted in the word of God who speaks truth. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord. From my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. And that's why I say that the coming of this day is a fact. There's no one greater than God by whom he could swear, so he swore by himself. We've already seen in verse 19 that the Lord is the God who speaks truth and righteousness. That he is the God of righteousness. He is righteous, so he righteously speaks truth. On the authority of the the word of Almighty God, I am telling you this morning that the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. This statement in verse 23 is not the last word that the Bible has to say about this day. Further light is shed upon it in the New Testament and we will turn to two places there. First of all in Romans 14. So I invite you to turn there now. And as you do, Imagine with me that you left your Bible here this morning and as you're eating dinner this evening, you remember, oh, I left my Bible up at the chapel. I'm going to go run and get it. And when you pull up to the building, it's after dark. Uh, When you arrive, all the lights are off in the building and the front door is locked. Well, you see Bob Campbell inside. And you knock on the glass doors, and Bob lets you in. And the first thing you do is look to the left, down Chapel Hall, um, past the hospitality area. What do you see? What do you see? You see the rough outlines of tables, chairs, rugs on the floor, lining both sides of the hallway, right? Even if it's your first time this morning, I think you can picture what I'm talking about. Now, there are, there is some light coming through the windows because of the lampposts in the parking lot. So the room is dimly lit. But there are rows of lights running down the ceiling on either side of Chapel Hall. Uh, And as you step into the foyer, Bob flips the switch on one side and then the other. Now what do you see? Now you see the color of the couches. You see the pattern on the rugs. And maybe you even see the texture on the wooden tabletops. Did anything essential to the room change when the lights came on? 
No tables were moved, no rugs, no chairs. Did anything change about the room? What once were dim outlines and shadows became substantial, textured, and colorful in your sight. That's how B.B. Warfield illustrated the light that the New Testament sheds on our reading of the Old. In an essay on the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, he wrote, The Old Testament may be likened to a chamber richly furnished but dimly lighted. The introduction of light brings into it nothing which was not in it before, but it brings out into clear view much of what is in it, but was only dimly or not even at all perceived before. Uh, So lest we settle for a dim outline of Isaiah 45, Let's uh, flip two light switches on provided in the New Testament, first in Romans 14 and then in Philippians 2. So in Romans chapter 14, verse 11, uh, in, in this context, Paul is addressing the subject of Christian liberty, specifically as to the eating of certain foods and the observance of certain days. Believers must not judge or despise their brothers in these matters since All of us are accountable to God and will stand before him in judgment. And then in Romans 14, 11, he supports that point by quoting Isaiah 45, verse 23. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. This reveals at least two things for us for our purpose this morning. For one thing, Paul reaffirmed the abiding authority of Isaiah's prophecy about this coming day. In other words, Isaiah prophesied that this day was coming. I'm telling you it's definitely still coming, is what Paul is saying. And second of all, this is helpful for us as we go to Philippians 2 next because it shows us that Paul found this uh, verse in Isaiah 45 to be practically useful for his ministry as a pastor to the churches to whom he was writing. It was on his mind, is the point. So in Philippians 2, the second light switch, so to speak. In this context, Paul's burden is to preserve the harmony of the church at Philippi by exhorting them to humility so that they might effectively strive side by side for the advancement of the gospel. He wants to promote unity among them. And the master in the art of humility is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one whom we must uh, study and imitate. That's why he exhorted them in Philippians 2.5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And now in verses 6 through 8, Paul lays out the mindset of Christ exemplified first in his state of humiliation. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ exemplified humility in one gracious downward movement that Paul viewed in two aspects. First, in his incarnation, verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. In the recent total eclipse that came over Dallas, the sun lost nothing of its native beauty and light and glory, uh, but was still the same as it was from the beginning, only concealed behind the sun. That's the image John Owen used to illustrate the reality that the eternal Son of God emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. The one who eternally existed in the form of God, co-equal with him, true God of true God, took on the form of a servant by being born in the likeness of men. To use John's term, the Word of God who was in the beginning with God and who was God who had a glory with God before the world existed, he became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what Paul meant when he wrote that he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man, 
so that as the God-man, he underwent the second aspect of humiliation that Paul uh, speaks of in verse 8, it's his suffering. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As the Heidelberg Catechism teaches, our mediator needed to be a true and righteous man because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which has sinned should make satisfaction for sin. But one who is himself a sinner cannot satisfy for others. And he needed to be true God so that by the power of his Godhead he might bear in his manhood the burden of God's wrath and so obtain for us and restore to us righteousness and life. Being found in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. He did for us what we never could have done for ourselves. Since we are neither God nor righteous people, He did for us what our stupid idols could never do for us, though they may promise to do. He humbled Himself and suffered in our place so that He might exalt us and bring us to glory. That is a righteous Savior. Based upon his humiliation unto death, he was highly exalted. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. In his bodily resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, Jesus Christ was highly exalted and received the name that is above every other name, Lord. This is the shining forth of the sun after the eclipse in which the glory of Christ once concealed is now manifest not by putting off his human nature but by glorifying it so that he is not only in his earthly life and death but also in his heavenly session at the right hand of God truly God and truly man. In other words, in his exaltation He was publicly declared to be what he always has been as God. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is now Lord over all, as Peter said in Acts 10.36, with everything being subjected under his feet. As the writer of Hebrews wrote, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, We do not yet see everything subjected to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We do not yet see everything in subjection to Christ the Lord, but one day we will. One day he will fully and consummately received the reward for his sufferings. Universal reverence and recognition. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a clear allusion to Isaiah 45, verse 23. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Can you see the light that sheds on our text in Isaiah 45? Who is the Lord, the creator of all things, from Isaiah 45, verse 18? Who is the Lord, the one who speaks truth and righteousness, from Isaiah 45, verse 19? Who is the Lord? the only righteous Savior who is greater than idols from Isaiah 45, verse 20 and 21. To whom must all nations turn and be saved? And to whom will every knee bow and every tongue confess on that day? Who? Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Jesus Christ, eternally one with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, is Lord, the sovereign creator, the only righteous Savior, the one who speaks righteousness and truth. There is none like him. There is none besides him. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, For us, there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things exist and through whom we are. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? You who are blessed, you this morning who are blessed with eyes to see this, and ears to hear. You know by experience what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. With the eyes of your heart, you see and savor the glory of God concentrated in the face of the exalted Lord Jesus. Behold your God this morning, church. Behold your God. The fact is that the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What will it be like to experience that day? According to Isaiah, it depends who you are depends who you are. Look back at Isaiah 45, verse 24 and 25. On that day, some will be ashamed. Some will be ashamed. In the last half of verse 24, to him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. In context, all who were incensed against him are those who actively committed themselves uh, to their idols and their own devices and have refused to turn to the Lord. And today, this describes you if you have never turned to the Lord as the only righteous Savior. You may be someone who consciously rages at God. You hate the God that I'm describing. That may be you. But others may be indifferent to spiritual matters and thoughts of God. You may just not care. Some may profess to be a Christian, but you are living a compromised life by embracing your idols instead of tearing them down. In any case, those who refuse to turn to the Lord, not only in word, but also in deed, will be ashamed on that day. And if that is you, please, please listen to me. I'm not speaking down uh, when I say these things as if I'm above you with any confidence in my own flesh. I hope I'm not. I'm pleading with you as someone who knows at least a, a fraction of the fear of the Lord. And I want to persuade you to turn to the Lord. You will be ashamed on that day. That is because sin is deceitful. It, it's promising something to you that it can never give. When have alcohol or lust, honestly, when have they ever delivered on their promise of escape and not demanded more from you the next time? When has greed ever satisfied the desire for itself? When has envy ever given you what you feel like you lack? Name a time. Name a time. To the youth in particular and young adults. Do not buy the lie of our age that the more authentic life is the life of ungoverned self-expression. Don't buy it. That's an idol that needs to be torn down. If you live by that lie, you make yourself, your own whims and pleasures, your God. 
It may feel good in the moment, but it's, it will fail you in the end. The only way to live a truly authentic and fulfilling life is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore. You were made for pleasure. You were made for rest and comfort. And it is found truly only in one place. Turn to Him. Please. If sin can't deliver on its promise in temporal matters, how much less before Almighty God to whom you must give an account. On that day you'll be ashamed because the Lord will humiliate your false hopes. You'll be like the Israelites who put hope in the chariots of Egypt for shelter. Shelter from the Assyrians. Only to see the Assyrians strip them naked and carry them off into captivity. Your sins will be stripped bare on that day. And as you bow on your knees under the force of His glory and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be ashamed. Please. But don't just turn to Him because you'll be ashamed on that day. Turn to Him because He's wonderful. He is your Creator and the only righteous Savior. He's mercifully providing you the opportunity to be saved. This promise is for you. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be saved. And not only that, but even now, you may receive the gift of the Spirit and entry into the new creation in which He will renovate He'll renovate your heart, your will. He'll free you from those desires that tyrannize you. Turn to Him. On that day, others will be justified and will glory. Read verse 25. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. The blessings in this verse are explicitly directed toward the offspring of Israel. But the whole emphasis of this passage from verse 14 on is on a worldwide and everlasting salvation, which includes the Gentiles. It's, direct, it's addressed directly to the Gentiles. So I take it that anyone from the nations who turns to the Lord, whether from Israel or the nations, may claim these for their own. To those of you who have turned to the Lord, this is what it will be like for you to experience that day. And notice that the word and in verse 25 distributes that phrase in the Lord to both of the verbs. They will be justified in the Lord. They will glory or boast in the Lord. Justification is a verdict of acquittal in the courtroom of God that comes down the moment a sinner believes. As Paul wrote in Romans 5.1, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. You have been justified. That is, all your sins have already been pardoned. And the spotless righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you so that you are not merely innocent, but you're positively righteous before God. It's done. That's amazing. But justification also has a future aspect. They will be justified. Your present status anticipates the final day when it will be confirmed in judgment. On the day when every knee bows, you believers will be justified in the Lord. This is what Paul referred to in Galatians 5.5 5 as the hope of righteousness. Through the Spirit and by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness, to quote Herman Ritterboss, is the verdict which God will pronounce before every eye and ear. You will be justified in the Lord. There is no condemnation for those who are in union with Jesus Christ, the righteous one. There's no condemnation now, nor will there ever be. If you're in Christ, you have absolutely nothing to fear in judgment. You should live your life confidently for the Lord in the present. 
seeking happily to conform your life to his law. You should go from here, gladly aiming to bring more and more of your life under his lordship for his pleasure, knowing that you have nothing to fear before him because you're in Christ. And on that day, you believers will glory or boast in the Lord and not in yourselves. You will say with the church, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. You will rejoice that the mouth of the fool has been shut for good, who says there is no God. You will exalt that the pagan who taunted you throughout your life, asking, where now is their God? will be answering his own question, confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. You will experience the fittingness of that time when the Lord Jesus receives the universal reverence and recognition that he deserves. Finally, finally, my creator is reverenced as he ought to be. That's right. Finally, my Lord and Savior is receiving the full reward for his sufferings. This is right. Finally, your faith will be made sight and you will be like him because you will see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. That's the day of Revelation 5, 11 through 13. Then I looked, says John, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing." And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Delight in him. Delight in him because of who he is and hope in him because the day is coming when you will be justified and you will glory in him. Let's respond by standing and singing hymn number 55, The Lord is my salvation. Amen. Father, there is no one like you. There is none before you. Your word has been sown in the hearts of your people, and I pray that you would give the increase by the power of your Holy Spirit. And now, church family, may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You're sent.